Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Book of the Day show. I'm talking with the amazing Adam Braun and his New York Times bestselling book, The Promise of a Pencil. Uh, a little bit of a warm day here in my backyard, Beverly Hills, California. Is, uh, stays nice and toasty these, these days. This book uh, is going to hit you on multiple levels. It has the potential, I just tell you this, to change your life. Why? Because, as you're going to hear, Adam, uh, he's a big believer in not just for-profit business or non-profit, but for purpose. You know, as the old saying goes, what is it? Profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul. And you can interpret that whether you be religious or not religious in the sense that a life without purpose, whatever you consider purpose, is basically meaningless. Uh, and so... We're, we're going to go in here with Adams uh, on the line on how he went from, you know, thinking he was going to be in high finance and just making money to going out, traveling the world, 40 or 50 countries, backpacking and discovering uh, a purpose from a, just a, a poor homeless person in India's words to him, how that changed the trajectory of his life. Talk about his mentors, uh, wise words of wisdom that they gave him that really kept him from taking a job that you'll see turned out to be uh, a company that went bankrupt and thank goodness they didn't go down that route. So it's just an amazing story. A lot of you know who Adam Braun is. He has Richard Branson here recommending the book, Deepak Chopra. He spoke at the White House. He's spoken multiple times for the United Nations uh, for the Clinton Global Initiative. So Adam, thanks so much for being on today's call. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Happy to be here. You got all kinds of good stuff here. Spoke at the White House, the Clinton Global Initiative, United Nations. Did you? Was that when Clinton was the uh, president, or? Uh, so I spoke at the um, United Nations a couple times now, but uh, the Clinton Global Initiative uh, was after he was president, but really when he started to kind of kick off uh, CGI, and uh, they were kind enough to reach out to me and have me participate in the event. Awesome. So let's just jump right in here. Um, there's this saying, you know, there's the known knowns, that is the things we know we know, and then there's the known unknowns, the things we know we don't know, but then there's also the unknown unknowns. And you talk about this line, the single most powerful element of youth is that you don't have the life experiences to know what can't be done. So when you were starting out, um, did you have any idea it would grow into this big charity and this big movement? And maybe talk a little bit about how you took it from just an idea, because I meet everybody, and most people have ideas, but very few people actualize them. What Can you just walk yeah. us through that? Sure, sure. So, you know, there were kind of two moments. Um, you know, there was one where I had the idea for the organization. So just to kind of give the brief backstory. Uh, I was born in uh, New York. I grew up in Connecticut and just had a real interest in business, in particular finance, since I was pretty young. Uh, I traded basketball cards and picking stock kind of seemed like the adult version of that. <laughs> and so um, I opened up an e-trade account when I was 13. I started working at hedge fund when I was 16. I was on the funds by the time I was 19. And I was on this fast track to this Wall Street career that I was really excited about. But uh, when I was 21, I went into the developing world for the first time as a study abroad student. Uh, on the semester at sea program. And when I got to um, each country that we traveled to, I would ask uh, one child in each country a simple question, and that was, if you did have anything in the world, what would you want most? And uh, when I went to India, the poverty was just the most stark and devastating I had ever seen, and I felt pretty helpless. And that's where I met a street beggar, and I asked him, and his answer, if he could have anything in the world, was a pencil. So I gave him my pencil, and he just lit up, and uh, I started uh, asking questions, and I realized this boy had never been to school before in his life. and that was just something that I never considered to be reality. Uh, I think growing up in the States, you assume every kid has the opportunity to go to school. Maybe it's a really poor school. Maybe it's uh, well attended or the teachers don't pay attention. But a kid who had never been to school for a day in his life was just kind of unfathomable to me. So uh, I, I started backpacking and traveling through a lot of different countries, about 40 or 50 uh, in my early 20s, and uh, just kept on living in these communities and seeing how uh, little support they got, but how uh, they had the same level of, uh, you know, I would say desire and vigor and dignity and, and humility uh, that anyone else that I'd ever met had and that my family 
kind of was in that position two generations ago. You know, my great parents living in the rural countryside of Eastern Europe. And uh, it was through education that, that things got elevated for my dad to grow up as an immigrant in New York with almost nothing. And then, you know, again, invest in his education and uh, then create a better life for his kids. Um, and, you know, my siblings and I went to great public schools and, and felt like we had you know, great opportunities because of it. And so anyway, I just became really impassioned about it. But uh, I started working in New York and uh, I found myself at a great job I was working at Bain and Company. Uh, arguably the top consulting firm out there. Mm -hmm. And I was watching how all these Fortune 500 companies were being run and learning so much in the process. But at the same time, I felt really frustrated that so little of that for-profit business acumen was actually being applied to the way that nonprofits ran themselves. And so, you know, I volunteered, I participated in different nonprofits, and it always felt like people, you know, just brought a lot of passion to the table, which is important, but they couldn't oftentimes wed that to for-profit business acumen. And so... Uh, while they could take really pretty photos and tell great stories, they weren't actually producing results. And that's what right. I heard about most because that's kind of how I've always viewed the, the world, and in particular running any business. So my family was turning 80 just before my 25th birthday, and I, I got this idea. Bain uh, lets you go on what they call an externship. It's basically a six- to nine-month sabbatical. And I pitched them on uh, letting me leave and, and start something entrepreneurial, and that was called Pencils of Promise. And this is where I can kind of address your question, which is, I know it was going to become a big organization. Um, the night that I thought of the name of the organization and the idea that I could use the externship and uh, crowdsource the money from friends in increments of you know 20 or 30 bucks, I knew I could pull that off. And um, most people said it was crazy because this is October 2008, you know, the worst economic period in New York in uh, 50 years, maybe more since the Great Recession. And so everyone else said it was crazy, but um, to the quote that you referencing that I write about in the book, you know, the most powerful element of youth is that you're too young to know it's impossible. Right. And so in that you're willing to try. And so I didn't realize how impossible it would be. And I was like, uh, I can go for this. I, I think I can pull it off. And it was really after the very first party, which was my birthday. I just asked friends to get $20 at the door for um, a birthday party on Halloween uh, when I'm born. And there was uh, one girl in particular who followed up with me and said, I want to get involved. I said, okay, all right. And, and at this point, it was just a personal project to honor my grandmother and raise the funds on the side of my job and even put in some of the, the capital I had saved to personally fund the school. And um, this girl said, you know, this is exactly what I'm looking for. I love I work in real estate, but I have relationships um, to people that do corporate sponsorship for events. I think for our next event, uh, we can get a liquor sponsor and a food sponsor and maybe even a venue sponsor. And I was like, whoa, what do you mean our next event? Like, you want to be a part of this too? Because I thought, you know, everyone just thought I was crazy. And as soon as this one person said to me, yeah, I really believe in it. I mean, her name's Mimi Wench. She's telling you this exactly. You know, this is probably six weeks after the organization was founded. We had $8,000 in our bank account. Um, and I said to her very directly that night, I said, Mimi, if you are willing to invest in this the way that I know I am, and I just have even one other person, I guarantee that there are many others that, uh, out there that feel this way, and people collectively build hundreds of schools together in the coming years. And it was such a ridiculous thing to say back then, but um, I just knew it would happen. I just absolutely knew it. Uh, and then everything after that was about putting in the work. Yeah, that's a great story. I think that uh, you hit on all kinds of points. One of the interesting ones I will talk about a little bit later is the, you know, the business side of things. And people really misunderstand, I think, when it comes to charity, most charities uh, misunderstand what business is so they go we're not a business we're a charity we're not here to make profit but really if you know Peter F. Drucker the, the greatest of all uh, business professors and teachers he says the purpose of a business is never to make a profit the per that is a necessity the purpose of a business is the creation of a customer and the second the mindset of mm. a business of a charity switches to that then it becomes aligned and realizes it is a business. It's the business in this case. And you, you generally, in business, have two customers. You have, in the case of a charity, the donors and then the people that you're giving the money to. But we'll, we'll, I want to talk on the business a little later. Let's go back to this concept of, of destiny. A lot of people listening to this, uh, and one of the most common questions, I think, really in the world at large is, what am I doing with my life? Is it something meaningful? And you say something you know, many of us spend our entire lives in the same bu bubble. We surround ourselves with people who share our opinions, speak the same way 
we speak and look the way we look. We fear leaving those familiar surroundings, which is natural, but through exploration of the unfamiliar, we stop focusing on the labels that define what we are and we discover who we are. And, and I'm a little like you, I've been lucky enough to go to about 51 countries and I think that was an integral mm -hmm. part. How important for people you know, in wealthy countries, a lot of people listening, uh, we have 40 countries listening in, but for those of people in, in the first world countries, how important do you think it is to just get on a plane and, you know, make an adventure out of it and just go see India and go see Bangladesh and go see, you know, the favelas of Brazil? Do you think that's an integral part in, in almost every or should be an integral part in almost every person's life? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, I think the most powerful thing that any individual can really do uh, besides obviously surround themselves with people who, who really make them better is to get outside of their comfort zone. And so there's another line in the book, um, true self-discovery begins where your comfort zone ends. And I just find that to be so true. But the one thing that I would kind of caveat that with is the idea that um, getting out of your comfort zone doesn't necessarily have to mean global travel. Uh, oftentimes it can be travel into you know the other side of your town where you've never really spent much time. Uh, it can also mean trying out uh, new hobbies uh, or activities that you've never done before. So. An example of that for me is when I was on semester at sea uh, as a 21-year-old, you know, my whole identity at that point in my life was as a basketball player. I played basketball since I was a kid. I was recruited to play college basketball. Um, as a 21-year-old on semester at sea, uh, you know, my whole identity at that point in time was as a basketball player. Uh, I had been playing basketball my whole life. I was recruited to college for basketball, and suddenly I'm on the ship. And uh, my closest friend on the ship, who had also mainly played sports throughout his life, came up to me pretty early on in the voyage and said, hey, do you want to go uh, do improv? Uh, this guy's teaching improv classes, and he's creating an improv troupe. And I remember thinking, like, you're out of your mind. You know, I'm an athlete. Athletes don't do drama. We don't act in plays. We don't do improv. But uh, this guy, you know, my closest friend, was up for it. And I felt like, you know, maybe I'll learn something by getting out of my comfort zone. And it was the improv troupe that I ended up joining and, and literally performing twice, two huge shows on our ship to the other students, that eventually gave me the comfort and confidence to become a really effective public speaker. And so anyone who's ever seen me speak at an event knows I don't read for notes, you know, everything is off the cuff, but that level of comfort was only uh, developed because of getting outside my comfort zone. So, you know, while I would definitely say that a uh, person should prioritize travel, and ideally you can get to remote parts of the world that challenge your way of thinking and you know, make you recognize how big the world is and how little your uh, little bubble is within it. Um, but at the same time, I think that you can also be creative in finding ways to challenge yourself and get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. My, one of my mentors, Joel Salatin, used to always say, you can always bloom where you're planted. Whether you live in a small town or, or a big city, there's always people in need. I mean, if you go in L.A., if you go down to Skid Row, I was down, down there not too long ago, and it's just like... You know, almost as I've been to India. It's not quite as poor as India, but uh, there's all kinds of, you know, poverty. Exactly. Now let's talk about kind of switch gears here to the this broad concept which you touch on throughout the book about just destiny in general. Some people are gonna start for profit businesses. Some people are gonna be entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, work in someone else's organization. Some people are gonna start charities like you've done. How do you think? people or, or maybe let's start how did you get that clarity like yes this is me and how do you think people listening in uh, some of the good tools to really know with some level of certainty that your life's on the right track in terms of you know destiny are you doing the career that really fulfills you are you with the people that really fulfills you how do you move your life closer and closer it's not obviously a black and white where you're like I'm 100% sure yeah. What are some ideas you have and that you've learned there? Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a bunch of different uh, kind of, I would say, tips of the trade <laughs> that I've shared with people in the past. Um, you know, I think one of them uh, is to truthfully uh, write. Um, so I think that anyone that doesn't have a journal is really losing out on um, a tremendous tool in self-discovery. And so... You know, my mom was the one who introduced me to the concept of meditation uh, when I was a teenager. And the way that she described it is uh, to say to me that, look, you know, you have this internal voice going on in your head all day long. You think of it as an internal monologue. But the truth is there's actually you have to be a speaker and then a listener. And the speaker you can really think of as your, your conscious. 
uh, mind, and the listener is the subconscious mind that's kind of catching all of what you're saying. And um, through meditation, you're kind of slowing down and listening to that subconscious mind. And what I find is if I have a journal and I'm writing freehand, not typing, but actually writing freehand, I care so much about every single sentence, and, and I write literally for nobody. Um, I write for myself, but uh, all of my journals, I've, I've been writing since I was 16, I write under the expectation that no one will ever see them, ever. Um, but I just write for myself, and I, what I find is that my, my kind of internal truth comes out, and I almost end up writing like uh, the kind of voice of my future self to my present, like, hey, Adam, stay true to this, or don't go out and do that. You know that in your heart of hearts this is the right path. And for some reason, just slowing down and writing freehand in that way has always been a hugely helpful tool for me. Uh, a second thing that I would say is, um, you know, if you think about uh, the people that are really kind of following their, their sense of purpose or, or destiny or, you know, uh, why they feel like they're here, uh, they're the type who oftentimes, uh, they don't sleep very easily because they're off at night thinking of these big ideas or they're, you know, anxious in the morning. And, you know, if, if you look at your own life and you think about uh, your own kind of work, if you're going to sleep easy, and feeling like really content, chances are you're probably not challenging yourself enough. And so that's not to say you should always have sleep problems, but you know you know that you've found that thing when you have this kind of almost manic level of internal excitement about it, that it keeps you up late at night and wakes you up early in the morning, and you can't wait to get to address that thing because you're just constantly coming up with ideas. Um, and then uh, a, a third thing that I would say is, you know, truthfully, I think people rarely. Uh, I display tremendous vulnerability in asking others for feedback. And so something that I really consistently do is I, I ask uh, the people that I'm closest to in my life, uh, whether that's family members or, you know, coworkers or my closest friends, uh, if I can spend quality time with them alone, and then I'll prepare a series of questions that I'd like them to answer. You know, things like, um, what do you wish I did differently? Or uh, what do you need and want from me? Or... Uh, how can I be the best friend or sibling or whatever it might be to you? And then uh, what should I do differently in my life? And what do you think makes me most come alive? Uh, what path should I be pursuing? And when you start to get, uh, I would say objective, but, um, but somewhat uh, subjective in that they know you so well, advice, you, you, it kind of reflects back onto you all these truths that were there all along, but sometimes they're just kind of living in your blind spot. Yeah, there's an ancient... Uh, proverb that says make war with a multitude of counselors so it's like you go out life is a little bit like war we have conflicts eternally externally with other humans with life in general and aging and time and so the president of the United States has a cabinet and most people don't have a cabinet and it makes all the difference in the world to have a bouncing board and go now the key caveat there is only surround yourself as cabinet members, so to speak, with people that deserve uh, to be listened to in terms of not not from a respect standpoint, but for they've earned the right. You know, they've done things. Uh, I always say try to find people that are doing what you want to do, but they're 10 to 20 years ahead of you. These are the mentors. D did you have some mentors, and, and who were they uh, that you really look back and go, thank God I met these people because without, you know, Bob, Susie, I would have gone down a totally different track. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, like you, am a huge, huge, huge fan of um, finding mentors. I mean, it's incredibly valuable. So I, at all times, have multiple mentors in my life. Um, and one thing that I think people don't realize is, is as much as you can kind of uh, seek out mentorship, at the end of the day, mentors pick their mentees. It's not the other way around. Um, I find that mentors have to kind of make the choice to invest in that individual and partially because it's making returns in their own life, but more because they see huge value in that, that person becoming, you know, the best version of themselves. So, you know, my, my first mentors were, were my parents. Um, you know, my mom on kind of the, the side of integrity, it's her favorite word, and not to say that my dad doesn't have it, but my mom just holds that <laughs> of all else. And then my, my, my dad has um, really good business sense, um, and he's just the type of person who wears his emotions and his thoughts on his sleeve. And so I know if I ask him a question, he's going to tell me the truth, whether I want to hear the truth or not. He's going to tell me like, uh, tell it to me like it is. So it starts with, um, 
you know, in the household, and that includes my, my brother and my sister as well, both have been, you know, hugely valuable to me. But I would say in my career, um, a lot of the members of the Pencil of Promise Board uh, really started out as, as um, people that I sought advice from and then started to become very clear mentors. And then I built my board um, at top over the years as almost like a council of mentors who now uh, are no longer loyal to me, they're loyal to the organization. So you talk about, you know, the president having a cabinet. I, I can think of that as like, you know, my professional board of directors, um, but I think people can have like a personal board, right? Mm -hmm. That holds you accountable and, you know, helps you set goals, all these things. So uh, I write about one of mine in the book. His name is Ray Chambers. And um, Ray is a businessman who essentially created uh, leverage buy-up in the modern private equity industry, uh, retired close to a billionaire, I believe, if not a billionaire, um, and uh, decided that he wanted to use his life um, in humanitarian interests towards public service. And so he co-founded America's Promise with Colin Powell, uh, among the famous things that he's done. Um, but he's now the UN Special Envoy for Global Health. So he's responsible um, for getting the world to achieve the Millennium Development Goals around health. And he's just this kind of incredible sage-like figure who, you know, I, I kind of felt honored just to be in a, a room with him the first time that we met. And um, for one reason or another, he kind of chose me to you know, take on as a mentee. And, and Ray just has so much wisdom. Uh, and I think one of the things that uh, we connect on is this idea that you can kind of use the best of the business world to impact a mission, a humanitarian mission that you deeply care about. And, uh, you know, he's at first, even if I check in with him once a year, that one time a year that I check in with him can completely transform, you know, how I'll operate for the next six to 12 months. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting as you really, you know, I like to read and, and study people who have done big things throughout history. And in it, I just finished this book called The Liberator about General Felix. He's one of the heroes of World War II, and sure enough, you dissect the story, there's, there's a mentor taught him courage in the face of fire, and uh, humans, there, there's a good book called Social by a professor from uh, UCLA, Harvard guy, it, he says, you know, the human brain is basically designed from a scientific standpoint to learn socially. So. We have this idea, I think, that, you know, the famous uh, poet that said, no man is an island. We, we tend, in the modern world, because of the way the media portrays people like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates as these lone islands of genius, which there is an element of truth to that. Um, but when you really dissect the story, for example, if you ask Bill Gates, he said, I never did anything alone. And so your life becomes, in some ways, the... Uh, accumulation or, or the quality of your life is basically the cumulative total of the quality of these mentors this personal I tell people you can get a personal board of directors what you do is you say you reach out to some people that know you ideally and that you admire and you say you don't want to come after them too too aggressively you say hey you know I'd love to get your advice sometimes maybe once or twice a year I could take you out to dinner and uh, I've got a yeah. few smart people in the city. Maybe I could take you to dinner once a year. I'll pay and, and just run some ideas by you. And if you come off, mm. you know, not desperate, a little nonchalant, if you talk to every three people, one of them will say yes. And then you say, oh, and by the way, I've got a couple yeah. other smart people at this dinner. You mind if we all come together? There'll be eight of us. You do that twice a year and you do it consistently. And the next thing you know, it's your life it's like the uh robert frost you know the the path in the woods and he took the path less yep. trodden on and it makes all the difference in the world and and just having some smart people go you know i always tell people people say what's the best advice somebody ever gave you i said well sometimes the best advice you ever get from mentors three words don't do it you know and sometimes it's the opposite mm -hmm. definitely do it so what do you think looking back what was one or two of the greatest pieces of advice you ever got to start this charity, Pencils of Promise, and also for you to find, you know, and really feel fulfilled about what you're doing in life? Yeah, so um, this is advice from somebody, well, two pieces of advice, actually. So one was uh, <clears throat> right around the time that, um, actually, I can even think of three that were just really transformative for me, and this is taking back like, over the last decade, decade plus. One of them was um, right when I was coming out of college, uh, I was... <clears throat> You know, uh, like every other 
college student trying to find a job, right? And fortunately, I had this really strong resume and I could line up um, interviews at top investment banks, top consulting firms, and private equity um, firms as well. And so I ended up with uh, two job offers. Um, you know, some people made offers, uh, a lot didn't. But fortunately, I had one at uh, one of the top investment banks and one at one of the top consulting firms. And almost every single friend of mine and family member said, you've got to take the investment banking job because there's more money. Uh, and back then, it was about probably forty to $50,000 uh, of potential higher salary, including a bonus, uh, for the investment banking job. Now, in my mind, that was like all the money in the world, right? As a 23-year-old, that was a game-changing amount of money in my life. And so I also kind of felt like maybe I should take this investment banking job. But I spoke to this one CEO who was becoming a mentor. His name is George Bull. And George said to me, look, Adam, uh, I'm going to give you some counterintuitive advice. Uh, everyone else is probably taking you, telling you to take the banking job because it's more money. What I would tell you is to remove money from the equation and only take the job where you believe you will learn the most. Mm. Uh, and I was kind of surprised by that. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, in the first uh, part of your career, the only thing that I think you should prioritize is mastery. Uh, you should learn as much as you can and go to a place where it feels like a business. Uh, so, you know, they're paying you and you're learning and treat it like paid business school. And I guarantee you that it will give you the opportunity to make more in the future. And, and you know, there will be a time and place in your life where you should actually choose the money. And you'll have, uh, you know, one job uh, that there's an offer versus another offer. There's going to be a time and place to choose the money, but do it when the margin is much bigger. Uh, he said, you know, when you're in your 40s, you know, the difference between one job and another might be a couple million dollars. That at that point, maybe it makes sense, but right now, just in the grand scheme of your life, don't let that forty to fifty thousand uh, dollars take you from one job to the other. And so I ended up taking the job in Bain and consulting, which paid less. And ironically, a year later, the company that had offered me the banking job was Lehman Brothers, and Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy. Wow! Uh, almost a year to the day yeah. afterward, and went out of business. And so, not only did I choose the job to learn more, but I ended up actually choosing the job that, or if I'd gone with the job with more. The pay higher, I would have been out of work. Yeah. So that was a huge learning lesson. And eventually, when I went to the two tenths of the promise and I started it, and then I had to make this choice between do I stay at Bain or do I go pursue the promise full time? Again, it was the same choice. I mean, you know, my starting salary at um, Tenths of the Promise was one third of what I was expecting to make at Bain that year. Uh, literally a third. So anyone out there imagine your salary and then imagine it cut in third, it was pretty tough. Um, but I thought about the learning, and even if it had the promise failed, which I knew it wouldn't, you know, I would have been the number one executive at a uh, hopefully fast-growing organization. I felt like I would have learned more in that position than where I had reached in my Bain trajectory um, because my learning curve was slowing down. So that was one piece of hugely impactful advice from a mentor. Uh, a second one um, to share really quickly uh, was a guy that I met um, right after uh, we had opened up the first school. I was backpacking. Uh, through Southeast Asia, getting this first school underway, and uh, my visa expired, so I had to leave and come back. And when I left, I ended up in Bali, and I met this serial entrepreneur named Sheriff. And I said to him, hey, I'm just starting this organization, but I think it's going to have huge legs. What's your best advice? And he said to me, um, always stay guided by your values, not your necessities. And uh, again, I asked him to unpack it. He was like, look, if you have a fast-growing company, you're going to get offered a lot of stuff. People are, you're going to think you need certain things. You're going to want to make certain hires. You're going to you know, do what it takes to get it to succeed, but I can tell you, never sacrifice your value. Always stay guided by those over your necessities. Uh, and then the third piece of advice was right after we had, you know, finished probably around 30 schools, um, I got a chance to speak to the CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi, which I write about in the book, Kevin Roberts, the blog about us. I'm going to track him down. I had maybe 25 minutes to talk to him, and uh, the last thing he said to me, uh, I said, can we speak again in a few months? And he said, I'll tell you what, uh, let's talk when we get 100 schools. And at that point in time, like 100 was almost unfathomable to me. You know, I thought, hey, it's taking us almost two and a half years to get to 35. Uh, you know, let's, uh, I'm this guy's basically saying, in my mind, I'm not going to talk to you for another, like, three years. And I said, oh, you're, you're sure 100? I mean, that's kind of far off. And he said, no, you're going to get there a lot sooner than you realize. Uh, just uh, always say, um, always make the little decisions with your head and the big ones with your heart. And I remember writing that down. I put it up on my wall, and uh, we set up a goal to reach 100 schools within 18 months, and we did it. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. So the charity, the way it works, uh, you take the money, 
it's not literally because some people might get confused it's not literally just providing pencils you're building an yep. educational yep. whole system schools yep. books are you providing helping teachers and things like that too yeah 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 so i mean you can think of us as an education company right i mean the name pencil from it kind of harkens back to the origin story with this uh, boy in india but uh, we do a number of things. So we're most known for building schools. Uh, we've built just over 300 schools around the world. Uh, we focus in three countries, Laos, Ghana, and Guatemala. So uh, hmm. we wanted to develop a model that could be proven to work in each of the three major property zones, Asia and Africa and Latin America. And so that's why we work in those three countries, uh, one for major property zone to prove that the model can work in each. Uh, so we have just over 300 schools. Uh, we work very, very closely with local education ministries. And so we have about 100 full-time staff. Uh, most of our staff is in-country. 95% of our staff in-country is from the country in which they work. Okay. So we have a lot more Guatemalan staff or Ghanaian staff and, you know, Laotian staff than we do New Yorkers uh, or Americans. There's about 15 here in New York that oversee all of the global operations, but around 30 or so per country. Um, and they work directly with the education ministry. We go out, we source the uh, villages of greatest need, but also where the impact would be the greatest. And then they have to commit to about 20% of the funding okay. for every school. Because education doesn't work when it's a gift, when it's a handout. You know, the, the individual has to um, work for it themselves. So it's a co-investment model where uh, these communities um, are made up of individuals who are usually living in, in mud huts or bamboo huts or um, corrugated tin shacks. And so they don't have uh, the money between the full community to make up 20% of the fund, let alone 100. Uh, so they make it up in materials and labor. And so okay. it's uh, about $25,000, that's our price point. So for $25,000, anybody out there that might be listening to this, uh, you reach out to me, my email is adam at uh, the letter ipromise.org. So you can just reach out to me, adam at ipromise.org, let me know that you're in building school and I can connect in with our team. Um, but uh, that enables us to build the school with the community providing most of the labor, the mothers, the fathers, the siblings, and the elders. And then once the school opens, that's when the work really starts for us. So we have a really big program around teacher training and support, and then a really big program around um, technology and innovation in the classroom. And so we do a ton of testing, a ton of monitoring and evaluation, and uh, we're developing a really exciting uh, e-reader program as well where we're seeing incredible results with our students. So you're pushing kind of the envelope, testing new uh, techniques in terms of, I, I think that ed the education that people are going to have 20 years from now is not going to look like the education people had uh, in the 1950s. So you guys are testing any, uh, as we kind of close up this segment, any things you see that are, that you're pioneering or, or leading the way in new ways of educating kids? You know, some of the stuff that's happening in schools around the world is pretty archaic. Yeah, um, I mean, so I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, in my opinion, the, and many people in the education system acknowledge this, but, you know, education really hasn't changed since the uh, model was developed several hundred years ago. Um, and it was, you know, developed for an industrial economy. And so, you know, you put all the kids in one classroom together, you know, they all learn the same exact thing, and then the bell rings and they move to the next subject. It's almost like an assembly line. Right. It, was the way, it was the way of the time to reach mass education. Now that we've reached mass education and we're living in an information economy and, you know, an internet economy, uh, there's an ability to personalize education and to tailor it to the true preferences and, and the skills and abilities of students. And so, you know, our goal at Pencil of Promise is to really push the envelope and help develop the future of education. Yeah. If you look at the history of innovation, it rarely happens, you know, in the entrenched environment that always kind of happens on the outskirts uh, in what are considered low-value consumers. And next thing you know... Uh, you kind of topple the uh, entrenched industry. You know, Instagram uh, over Kodak is like a great example of that, right? Right. Um, and you see a lot of uh, things like that happening. You know, Airbnb and hotels. It just happens all the time. So Uber and taxis. We look at where we work. Yeah, perfect. So, so we look at where we are working, and we're on the outskirts, right, with the perceived low value consumer. So what that means is, uh, much like in the same way that you couldn't really try out a lot of innovation in a classroom in New Jersey because you have really strong teachers unions and you have government created programs that pour tons of money into very structured um, initiatives that are committed for 10 years, whereas the rate of acceleration in education is, you know, nonstop and every six months there's something new. So we look at where we are and it's very low cost. The adoption is very high and the scalability is enormous. 
Um, and so we're really kind of testing out what we believe can be the future of education and uh, centered around a couple of things in our mind. One of them is um, really uh, student-centered learning. And so not just making it the same thing for every child, but uh, making sure that each kid has the content and the support to pursue um, an educational path that applies to their learning abilities. Uh, a second is um, making sure that uh, students are able to act as teachers on occasion. So, you know, I learned in college by studying and then essentially kind of splitting up the class. And then before exams, my, I would kind of teach half the course to one of my friends and he or she would teach the other half to me. And, like, when you're the teacher, you really master the content. Uh, yeah. And then the third thing that, that I've kind of pointed to uh, pretty frequently is that in – the American education system, you always hear, like, uh, kids being told to sit still and pay attention, um, whereas brain activity, when you look at all the data, suggests that uh, when you have motion, uh, even for as little as 15 or 20 minutes, um, the brain learns much better after that motion. Huh. So, you know, in the developing world between classes, like, kids get up and they go outside and they go swimming in the river or they climb trees and then they come back. And that's actually much better for cognitive abilities than just having to sit still for seven hours a day. And so these are all things that we're exploring and, and hope we can uh, start to change, not just uh, abroad, but at home as well, eventually. Yeah, without a doubt, I think that uh, I, some of the reason the education system is the way that it is is because there was constraints on the way you taught 100 years ago, just like I just finished Henry Ford's autobiography. There was constraints on how you built. You couldn't build just in time like modern factories could do because back then you had to get a whole bunch of steel and build a whole bunch of cars ahead of time. There weren't the robotics and so on. And what's happened is for whatever reasons, you hit on some of those entrenched reasons, we haven't gone, look, we do not live in 1842. We can personalize very easily what people learn. We yeah. can do psychometric tests so we go, this kid, is probably not going to be a mathematician, but they're brilliant at you know dance, and then you get them dancing four hours a day, and and it's not as hard to do. Obviously, there still needs to be some level of, uh, you know, you, you need some uniformity so it's not complete chaos in a classroom. But now let's let's uh, switch here to a very specific subject. Uh, I'm interested to hear, and you touched on this a little bit in your ta uh, talking about how you took the job when you were offered 50000 more by the then uh, thriving Lehman Brothers, soon to be defunct uh, 2008 mm -hmm. victim of the crash. But you were given this advice, you know, don't take, uh, focus on knowledge. And, you know, I've founded this kind of movement called Knowledge Society, where I feel like we've moved past the information society, and now we're in the knowledge, the applied information. So thank you so much, Adam. If people want to, uh, buy your book it's of course available at all the big bookstores barnes and noble brookstones amazon if they want to reach out what's the best way to follow you and to give uh to pencils of promise the charity yeah so um i'm really accessible uh, my email is just adam at and then i uh, the letter of promise dot org uh so i would tell people to just straight email me you can check out more of my stuff on my website where i write it on blogs at adamgrant.com um, and then uh, the book is called The Promise of a Pencil, as you mentioned, it's at Amazon, Barnes and & Noble, and all major retailers. And then uh, the organization is pencilsofpromise.org. And so you can just go to the website, check out what we do, and we have a new uh, program right on the um, homepage uh, called Passport. That's a, a new monthly community um, where every single month, uh, through small contribution, you can transform the lives of some of our students. So that's pencilsofpromise.org slash passport. And on Twitter, I'm uh, at Adam Braun. Uh, Instagram and Snapchat, it's uh, at it, at Braun. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Adam. It's been a real pleasure and honor to have you on this Book of the Day show. And everybody, make sure you pick up this book. It's you. You got to read books of people uh, doing big things, but big things not just measured by big things for themselves, but big things for society at large. And so. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.